All right, if you'd please join me in Acts chapter 21, please. And Father, we ask that you'd give us the gift of teaching. Holy Spirit, you are our teacher. You are our guide into truth. We ask that you would bless us that way. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so last week uh, in the first part of chapter 21, we saw Paul's journey Uh, After he concluded his meeting with the elders from the church at Ephesus in Miletus, he carried on and was on his ascent to Jerusalem. And along the way, he stopped at Troas, he stopped at Caesarea, and there, just like every other place, he was warned of the Holy Spirit, the trouble waited for him in Jerusalem. And there was even a a prophet named Agabus that came and gave an illustration of him being bound. But none of those things moved him. And he basically said, I am ready. I'm ready to be bound. I'm ready to die for the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, which is a pretty bold statement, uh, which we'll examine a little bit more this morning. So now moving forward in Acts chapter 21, we are in Jerusalem. And we're going to see, hear and see some things that might smack of compromise. uh, Or they might smack of courage. And we need to understand which. And to help us do that, uh, Tim, if you go ahead and put that. <laughs> Tim, if you could go ahead and put up that uh, document. It's a very low, low quality graphic because that's my skill. Uh, we've been doing study of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, which began in Acts chapter 2. And in the course of the early church, God, revelation continued in the form of these inspired words we know as epistles as well as as acts. And so we're doing these things in their chronological order to get the historical context. And where where we are at this point in time in Acts chapter 1, by way of review, as you can see over me, uh, we started in the first chapter, first verse, ran through chapter 12, verse 24, at which point in time... The the pastor of the church of Jerusalem wrote a letter to the entire church. And we know that as the epistle of James. We went and studied that. When we were done, we came back to Acts, picked up right where we left off, ran all the way through uh, chapter 18, verse 11, considering Paul's first and second missionary journeys. And I forgive me for the formatting error uh, in converting a Word document to PDF, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, got messed up, they should be formatted in line with James and Galatians and 1 Corinthians. So just in your mind, put them over there. Uh, At Acts chapter 18, verse 11, Paul wrote a a letter to the church at Thessalonica, and shortly thereafter, he wrote another one. So we considered those. Then we went back uh, in Acts chapter 18 through much of chapter 19, and this has been Paul's third missionary journey, at which point, during which time, he wrote to the churches at Galatia, he wrote a letter to the church at Corinth, then he carried on in that ministry, came to another place, at which point he wrote Romans and First Timothy and Second Corinthians, and so we've been studying it in this order, and now... After doing that, we came back to Acts chapter 20, and we have gotten as far as, or we will get as far as the end of chapter 21. Uh, and these things, remember, this is, this is scripture, and they're being given to us, revealed by God in time. And so we have to put ourselves in that timeline, at least I did, had to put myself, myself in that timeline to understand what was going on here in the balance of Acts chapter 21. So... Just leave that up there, Tim. That's fine. Uh, Let's resume our journey in verse 17 of Acts chapter 21. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. So after all the foreboding by the Holy Spirit at every stop to the Apostle Paul, that trouble awaited for him in Jerusalem, Paul actually arrives. And he's in time for the Feast of Pentecost. And he's received by the brethren, which is the church at Jerusalem. And the reception is a warm one. 
After all, Paul and those who are with him, they are friendly faces <laughs> in, in the midst of persecuted believers. Their, their fellowship is very seat, sweet. It is welcomed. And of course, one of the driving reasons Paul is in Jerusalem is to present to this church the love offering of the Gentile churches. And so that is lovingly given. It is thankfully received. Uh, the fellowship is very sweet. Verse 18. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. So the next day, Paul has a meeting with church leadership, including the pastor and the elders. The pastor is James. Who is James? He's the son of Joseph and Mary. He's the half-brother of Jesus. He's the author of the epistle that bears his name. And the elders, remember this is the church at Jerusalem, the elders are all Jews. We're not given their names. Uh, The apostles were kind of centered around Jerusalem for a while. If Peter and John and the other apostles were there, do you think they'd been mentioned? Personally, I would. So, you know, I don't know, but I think it's probably reasonable to assume that Peter and John and the other apostles are scattered about doing the work of the Holy Spirit in other places. Verse 19. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. So Paul is giving to the leadership of the church at Jerusalem his ministry report. And he gives it, it says, particularly. It means in great detail. This was just not a, you know... 10,000 foot level kind of report. This was a detailed report about what God had done. You know, we're studying a book that's called Acts of the Apostles. Is that accurate? Not entirely. It's the act of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doing this work, doing the work through the apostles. And in particular with Paul, it's ministry amongst the Gentiles. It's Salvation is available to the Gentiles, too. It's a mystery that was true from before the foundation of the world, but it's now being revealed in time and predominantly through the Apostle Paul. Not initially. Who was the first sent to the Gentiles? Peter. In Acts chapter 10, he went to Cornelius' house in Caesarea. And they were filled with the Spirit. They were born again and... Peter went back and gave the report to Jerusalem what had happened. And that created a stir among the Jews. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Gentiles can be saved? Uh, No, salvation is of the Jews. So they had to become Jews in order to be saved. And that resulted in the, the first church council in Acts chapter 15, which was chaired by James. And he rendered the decision that that need not be true. But the ministry to the Gentiles, that mantle was pretty much placed on Paul. And you see the chronology of where he's been. And he wrote in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. Now, Paul gave this detailed testimony of what the Lord had done in the ministry that the Lord had given to Paul. And the Jewish leadership rightfully praises the Lord because it's his work. Uh, Paul's just a servant. Uh, You don't praise someone's servant, you praise the master. A servant doesn't seek his own praise, he seeks the praise of his master. And so all that's well and in order. Verse 20 continues... And they said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that we ought not, they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. So after getting this ministry report, praising the Lord for what he's done, James and the elders, they turn Paul's attention to the matter at hand. And the matter at hand is the Feast of Pentecost, which is one of the three compulsory feasts where every Jewish male is to get to Jerusalem. Uh, And so at 
this time in Jerusalem, there are, as James said, many thousands of Jews who believe and are zealous for the law. Well, who are these Jews and what do they believe? Uh, are they religious, law-abiding Jews that believe in the living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but do not believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Uh, are they religious, law-abiding Jews that believe in the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and do believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Or are they religious, law-abiding Jews that believe in the living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, believe that Jesus is the Christ, but they also believe that Jews have to become Gentiles in order to be saved? Or could it be there's a mixed multitude? There's some of all these people in this great mass of, of Jews. Well, we'll kind of sort that out as we get through the chapter. But moving on, all these Jews are aware of Paul <laughs> by his reputation, perhaps by personal experience. Perhaps they read one of his letters. And they're aware that he has been teaching the Jews, not living in Jerusalem, but living amongst the Gentiles, he's teaching the Jews to forsake Moses, the law, to not circumcise their sons, and to not live according to the Jewish traditions. Well, let's see, they're aware of that, but is it true? Is it fact? Is it fiction? Could things that Paul has said and done be twisted? Absolutely. So has Paul taught the Jews to forsake the law? No. In, in our scripture reading, verse 8, we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. In Romans chapter 7, and I'm only going to be referencing scripture that's been revealed at the point in time of Acts chapter 21. He's written to the Romans that the law is good and holy and just. In Galatians chapter 3, let's go to Galatians chapter 3 quickly. Or as quickly as your little fingers will take you. <laughs> Galatians chapter 3, starting in verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there be a law given which should, be, should have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture has concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for we are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Paul has said that there is no that are righteous, no, not one. Everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. And Abraham was accounted righteousness unto God because he believed. The law was yet future to Abraham. And so he lays all of this out in the book of Romans. He lays all of this out in the book of Galatians. Paul has not taught the Jews to forsake the law. He's taught them the purpose of the law. Well, has, going back to Acts chapter 21, has Paul taught the Jews to not circumcise their sons? What is circumcision, by the way? God's sign of the covenant to to Abraham. He's not taught that. But he's teaching what it means. And he's echoing the law and the prophets. Uh, in Galatians chapter 5, Paul would be inspired to write, uh, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, meaning you're going to keep the law, you're going to be acceptable to God because you're keeping the law. 
that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become no effect of you, whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. The nature of the gospel is being revealed in time. In the letter to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul wrote, if any man call, if any man called being circumcised, meaning he's Jewish, let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision, meaning Gentile? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he is called. If you're, if you're Jewish, Jewish. If you're Gentile, Gentile. But the command of God is to believe on him whom he has sent. And that is Jesus Christ. Uh, in the second chapter of Romans, Paul would write, For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. That's not news. Moses said that in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16. Circumcision is of the heart. That was spoken of by a prophet, Jeremiah, chapter 4, verse 4. Circumcision is of the heart. Uh, so Paul is not saying, don't be circumcised. He said, well, well, we need to understand what it is, what it means. And, it, it, and it's to be a sign of the inward. Has Paul taught the Jews that they should abandon all their Jewish traditions? No. What has he taught? Uh, he said, be followers of me, even as I am of Christ. Well, then what did Christ say about the Jewish traditions? Let's go to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, starting verse 6. He, Jesus, answered and said unto them, well has Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandments of God, ye hold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition." For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curses father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, It is korban, it's a gift to the temple, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or mother, to forsake his father, or mo for his father and mother, don't look after them first. Making, verse 13, the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such things do ye. What's the most important commandment of God? With all your... And the second one is like the first, which is to... And upon those two hang all the law and all the prophets. The traditions that they were keeping made of none effect the word of God. Jesus called them on it. Did Paul? No. He's saying, I'm following Jesus. Follow me, following Jesus. So back to Acts chapter 21. In this assertion, the back half of verse 20 and in verse 21, here we have the root of the trouble that's waiting for Paul. It's gossip. It's twisting and misrepresenting what God has said. And it's a lack of knowledge of Scripture. And these things are combining to result in where we're headed. Uh, James, moving on then, James continues. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. In other words, Paul, 
get ready. You are public enemy number one. They're looking for you. And they're going to find you because you, as well as all the other thousands of Jews who believe and are zealous for the law, are going to be in the temple for this feast. And news that you are there is going to spread like wildfire. You're going to be about as welcome as an unsolicited opinion. Get ready. Verse 23. Do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. So well, take them take and purify, purify thyself with them and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing. But thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. What's James saying? We live in this town. We're persecuted by our own people. We don't want any more trouble than we already got. Tensions are already way too high. This is what we want you to do. We have a situation. We have four men who have taken a Nazarite vow, of which you can read about in Numbers chapter 6. And they are now completing their vow. They're completing their days of separation, and they're going to offer sacrifices at this feast. So what we want you to do is to receive them. We want you to go with them. We want you to purify yourself, keeping the Jewish religious ritual for ceremonial, ceremonial cleansing. We want you to cover their expenses. Each of them has to bring a lamb of the first year without blemish for a burnt offering. Each of them has to bring a lamb of the first year without blemish for a sin offering. Each of them must bring a ram without blemish for a peace offering. They have to bring unleavened bread. They have to drink meat, uh, bring meat offerings. They have to bring drink offerings. What are we doing on Wednesday night? What book are we studying? What do we know about what's all that's being said in the book of Leviticus? It's about... So we want you to cover all their expenses, bring all these offerings for them so they can shave their heads, so they can fulfill their vow of separation, and so that all the thousands of Jews who believe and are zealous for the law will know that the reports that they've been hearing about you and what you're teaching are not true. But instead, you, you like them, walk orderly. You're a law-abiding Jew. You're not an apostate. You're not a rebel. You also keep and observe the law just like them. And my mind went, time out. <laughs> Here we are, 30th years after Jesus. Uh, we have received additional revelation from God through Scripture. And some of that was written by James, who is saying these words to Paul. James wrote in chapter 2 that whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all. So it's not possible to please God by keeping the law. And in chapter 2, he also talked about faith and works. And the bottom line of all that is faith that saves works. But now he's talking about, it, as I read it, he's talking about works. But in addition to that, what has Paul already received from the Holy Spirit and distributed to the church? Galatians chapter 3, that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but that man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That's revealed truth. It was revealed before this conversation in Acts chapter 21, as was 
Paul writing that Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And writing to the Romans that the law declares the whole world guilty before God. And by the law comes the knowledge of sin. And by the law, sin multiplied. It abounded. But where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. And in chapter 7 of Romans, he did say that the law was holy and just and good and it's spiritual. But I'm sold, I'm carnal, I'm sold under sin. I know what I'm supposed to do. But I don't. I know what I'm not supposed to do, but I do. So there's something going on inside me. Who can save me from this body of death? Oh, I thank God for Jesus Christ. All of that revealed truth before this conversation in Acts chapter 21. So what's going on here? Is James compromised the faith? Has he compromised the gospel in the face of this persecution that they're enduring every single day? Is James advocating that Paul also compromise the truth and the faith and the gospel? You know, has, has persecution moved James away from the simplicity of Jesus Christ and the grace of God because of the pressures involved? Did he not read the letter to the Galatians? Did he not read the letter to the Romans? Do the church leaders in Jerusalem not yet understand the revealed truth of God given to Paul and through Paul? You know, what is going on? Verse 25. And as touching the Gentiles, which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled, and from fornication. Which all of which sounds familiar, because that's the very decision that uh, James made after the first church council in Acts chapter 15. But on the heels of verse 23 and 24, and then flowing right into that, is James saying that there's two kinds of believers? There's two kinds of salvations? There's two churches? What did Jesus say? To whom much is given, much is required. What does that mean? To the Jews were given the law and the prophets. Uh, Is that all about religious ritual observation? Or is that a depth and a breadth and a width of relationship based on a revelation of God given to them? It's not about religious rituals. It's about a relationship. So what's happening? Verse 26. Then Paul took the men, and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accompaniment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. How did Paul respond to the proposal by James? He accepted it. No argument, no objection. What's Paul thinking? Verse 27. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place, and further brought Greeks also into the temple and has polluted this holy place parenthetical thought, for they have seen before, they had seen before with him in the city, Trophimus, an Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. Paul takes the proposal from from James, and he moves forward, and he and the four Nazarites are almost done when Jews from Asia, Roman province, the most dominant city, Ephesus. Uh, So they're probably from Ephesus. They recognized Paul and they pulled the fire alarm. Verse 11 begins. What does verse 11 say? This is the prophecy of Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the men that own this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. It's beginning to unfold now. 
these Jews from, I presume, Ephesus get everybody's attention. This is Paul. This is the one we told you about. He's the one that's teaching against Moses. He's teaching against the law. He's teaching against us Jews, and he's teaching against the temple, which, by the way, he's defiled by bringing a Gentile in here. Now, again, this is all gossip. This is twisted misrepresentation of what God has said. And this is a false accusation, an, an unverified assumption. But they pull the fire alarm. And what happens after they pull the fire alarm? A fire. Don't you usually have a fire and then you pull the fire alarm? A uh, fire alarm gets pulled and now a fire breaks out. Verse 30. And all the city was moved. And the people ran together and they took Paul. And drew him out of the temple. And forthwith the doors were shut. Uh, the entire city was moved by the words of these Jews from Asia. And this is not a revival. This is not a revival. They have been ignited by the words of the Jews of Asia, and a mob was birthed. Paul is, it says, drew. It means dragged. He was dragged out of the temple, and I'm sure it wasn't gently or respectfully. And on this very important day of the feast, the temple doors are shut. Now, as we've gone through Paul's ministry, everywhere he goes, one of two things happens. A revival or a riot. Well, here we go again. There's another riot. Verse 31. And as they went about to kill him, tidings came in to the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in an uproar who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. A mob has been formed, and they attack Paul with a murderous rage. But isn't that the mentality of a mob? It's always violence. Mobs are not peaceful. Mobs are violent. And so what we have in Jerusalem is suddenly a tinderbox that is starting to be inflamed. And this is a big problem for the Romans. This is a bigger problem for the Roman authorities because if they don't get it under control, their lives are at stake, not to mention their careers. Uh, See, Pentecost, just like Passover, we have this massive influx of people such that the population of the city could approach two million people. And when you get that, the history is when that many Jews got together, they were oppressed, right? Right? They were under the hand of Rome. The nationalistic fervor got stirred and it rose. And rebellion and insurrection were a great danger to the Roman Empire. And they had a zero tolerance policy toward that. The governor at the time, during Jesus' time, the governor was Pilate. During this time, the governor is a cat named Felix. You got it. (laughs) You're old enough, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> now Pilate had the good sense to be in town Felix doesn't have the good sense to be in town he's over at Caesarea he's leaving Jerusalem to the chief captain who is the highest ranking military officer in Rome at the time he's a commander of thousands of soldiers and he is in Antonia Fortress which is on the north side of the Temple Mount overlooking the Temple Mount where all this hubbub is going on and So what does he do? He rallies his troops. He rallies his commanders. They rush down into the tumult with a great show of force. And when the Jews who are trying to kill Paul see them, they they back off. Because it's not given to them to do that. They endanger themselves by continuing. Verse 33. Then the chief captain came near and took him. And commanded him to be bound with two chains. And demanded who he was and what he had done. And some cried one thing and some another among the multitude. But when he could not know the certainty for the tumult, he commanded him to be carried into the castle. So, Paul obviously can see who's the center of this very dangerous situation. It's that guy. And so he seizes him. He has him arrested. He has him bound with chains to two Roman soldiers who I suspect were 
husky, and nasty. Then he demands to know from the Jews, who is this guy, and what did he do to cause you to act like this? And, they don't, and so he asks simple questions from the mob, but he gets no clarity. All he gets is confusion. And so without being able to ascertain the facts, the chief commander commands that Paul be taken to Antonia Fortress, where they will interrogate him, which cannot be a fun thing. But the prophecy of Agabus has come true. Paul is now bound with chains, the Jews surrendering him to the Romans. Verse 35. And when he came upon the stairs, so it was, that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people. For the multitude of the people followed after, crying, away with him. Because the Jews were in such a murderous rage, Paul, bound by chains to two Roman soldiers, had to be carried overhead and up the stairs, lest the mob got a hold of him and killed him. But the mob wants him dead. And so they're crying away with him, away with him, which is another way of saying kill him. I mean, away, literally away. We can't kill him. You guys kill him. Verse 37. And as Paul was to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? Who said, Canst thou speak Greek? Art not thou that Egyptian, which before these days made us an uproar, and led us out into the wilderness 4,000 men that were murderers? So Paul, he's been rescued, right? He's been rescued from the Jews by the Romans. Does he sound like he's worried, anxious? No, he seems quite calm. And he speaks respectfully to the authority there present says, may I have a word with you? You speak Greek? Only civilized people speak Greek. I thought you were that Egyptian who about six years ago just about torched this town. But you escaped out to the wilderness. Verse 39. But Paul said, I'm a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. Paul identifies himself. I'm a Jew. I'm a citizen of Tarsus, which is one of the predominant cities in the Roman Empire. And then he requests, again, he's speaking Greek. He requests to speak to the very people who bull rushed him, have been beating him, and have every intent of killing him. He wants to talk to them. Verse 40, and when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, uh, chapter 22, uh, oh, you're from Tarsus, you're Jew, you're not that Egyptian. Okay, the commander gives him permission to speak to this mob that is screaming for his death. And Paul beckons with his hand, and this mob, what happens to the mob? Mobs are not quiet. Mobs are very, very, very loud. What happens? They become silent. How? By whom? By the Spirit of God. Is Paul anxious? Is Paul worried? Is Paul fearful? Not in the least. He is absolutely baptized with the Spirit of God at this moment. Uh, So Paul, who has been speaking Greek to a Roman, now turns to the Jews and speaks Hebrew to them. And what he says, we'll get into next week. But, having seen now the end, as well as the beginning of this passage of scripture. Let's go back and revisit some of those passages wherein I had some questions. Uh, In verse 17. And when we are come to Jerusalem, let's just stop there. What, let's put our, try to put Paul's sandals on. What is in the Apostle Paul's heart? 
as he ascends into Jerusalem. Love. The love of God. How do we know that? Because he's already said so. In Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Starting in verse 1. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises who are the fathers, and of whom concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all. That can only be written from a heart of love. I wish I could trade places. I wish they knew what I knew. In chapter 10, also verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, But not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And Paul was ministering to the Gentiles. He's come back to Jerusalem. He's going to see his brethren. His heart is filled with love for them. Now verse 20, when we hear, going back to Acts chapter 21, when we hear James say what he said about who's there, uh, these many thousands of Jews that believe and zealous for the law, who were later ignited into a murderous mob. Who are they? Again, in the sequence of God's revelation, we have to remember what was told us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Give not offense neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. According to the revealed scripture, God's heart, there are three kinds of people on earth. There are unbelieving Jews, there are unbelieving Gentiles, And there's the church, comprised of both believing Jews and believing Gentiles. So who are these thousands of Jews who believe and are zealous for the law? Well, most certainly, they are believers in the living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But they are not believers that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And They're all riled up. What are they riled up about? The purpose of the law. And what Paul has said about the purpose of the law. They're riled riled up about the gospel of grace. They call it Paul's gospel. They're still riled up about the identity and the deity of Jesus Christ. And they're all riled up about salvation being available to the Jews. But in the historical context of what's going on in the church, and specifically in the church that's in Jerusalem, there's something else at play. Because Satan is attacking the unity of the church at this time. Trying to drive a wedge between Jew and Gentile. When Jesus broke down the separation and to bring them together... The church in Jerusalem at this time was exclusively Jewish. And they're still very attached to the law, to the sacrifices, and to the traditions. And they are wrestling with the revelation of God that there's neither Greek nor Jew. That it's whosoever will believe. They're still wrestling with that. And so part of the people referred to by James in chapter 20 could also be the Judaizers. You know, the religious, law-abiding Jews that believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They believe in Jesus Christ, but they also believe Gentiles must convert to Judaism and they must keep the law to be saved. They are anti-grace. 
And so they oppose Paul everywhere he goes. Now, re regarding the proposal with the four Nazarites and all these sacrifices, uh, what was in Paul's mind when he was presented this proposal that based on what he knew of the knowledge of the word of God was a, a compromise. What's in his mind? Well, it's not in his mind. It's not a compromise. His mind is all about love, the law of love, to not stumble a brother weaker in the faith whom James himself called the royal law. In James chapter 2, verse 8, uh, if we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, which has been written at this point in time, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, what is in Paul's mind when he hears this proposal from James? 1 Corinthians 9, starting in verse 19. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. That's what's in his mind. These are not just words. This is not just a philosophy. This is a truth. He's living it out here in Jerusalem. And we, you know, going back to our study on Wednesday where we're doing Leviticus, how is it that we're able to properly interpret Leviticus? Two rules, context and scripture interpret scripture. What scripture do we use to interpret Leviticus? The book of Hebrews. Wait a minute. It's not written yet. In Acts chapter 21, it's future. That revelation of God is coming. But it's the love of God that is in Paul's heart and it's in his mind. Later, those things are going to be expressed under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and what we know as the epistle to the Hebrews, which is the Holy Spirit's commentary on the law, on the sacrificial system, and on the Levitical priesthood. But in Acts chapter 21, it's not recorded yet. Now, the last two verses of this chapter, when Paul seeks and then is given opportunity to speak to the Jews, he is a child of light. He's baptized with the Holy Spirit, and he is speaking to darkness, the darkness of religion. That takes courage. When he said in verse 13, of chapter 21, verse 13. Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. That was not bluster. That was uncompromised courage. And the very foundation of it all in his heart and in his mind is the love of God. And the love of God does not compromise. It is not weak. It is not cowardly. In fact, it's the very fulfillment of the law. Romans 13, 10. And truth is where what I say equals what I do. And what I do equals what I say. Uh, Paul made a proclamation in verse 13, but now in Jerusalem, he is living it. It's not a, an issue of compromise. For the Apostle Paul, this is an issue of love and living the gospel that he's been preaching. So what does that mean to us today? Well, uh, the church living in the last of the last days is faced with compromise 
and courage. Just as Paul was that day, so is the church. Compromise is watering down the gospel. Compromise is playing down Jesus and the importance, the preeminence of Jesus. Compromise is tickling ears and being stirred by men, ultimately turning from the truth to fables, falling away. Compromise means coexist, embracing unity at the expense of truth. That's a choice facing the church. But courage is the other choice, where we follow Jesus and we stand on the gospel of grace, which has always been under attack. It will always be under attack. Courage is boldly proclaiming the name of Jesus, the only name given under heaven among men, whereby we must be saved from eternal death. And courage is to lovingly say words that tingle the ears rather than tickle the ears. Words like, you need to turn and face the sun or you will face the coming judgment of God. And I love you enough to tell you that. Those are the choices facing the church in these last of the last days. What choices are going to be made? I think many will compromise. I think few will have courage. So if we want to have courage, who doesn't? If you don't want to have courage, I was going to say stand up, but that wouldn't be. That that would be... (laughs) counterproductive. Uh, I'll let that go. (laughs) If you want to courageously and uncompromisingly stand fast in the Lord, three things. Number one, love the truth. What is the truth? Your word is truth. Love the truth. Eat the truth. Believe the truth because it's only by the truth of God that we will not be deceived by the world. Deception abounds. There's so many kinds, but artificial intelligence is a deception. The CEO of Google has stated he wants to create a digital God. Chat CPT is has got the the muscle, the financial and political muscle of Microsoft and most of the liberal party. It's real. Don't be naive. It's bizarre. It's even a little bit frightening. There's a, I I don't listen to the broadcast, but I saw an article about uh, Joe Rogan. There was a broadcast that was like War of the Worlds. Remember H.G. Wells, War of the Worlds? You know, this radio program, it's all make-believe, but then they got into telling the story and people jumped off buildings and, and Cities were thrown into a panic because of a radio broadcast. Well, something similar to that, his podcast. Well, this is an AI-generated podcast. And then they went on with it, and people couldn't tell the difference. Whoa. If that's possible, it's possible to deceive. And they'll deceive with words. The only way to know the deception is to know the truth. What's another deception? Deception. How about this transgender delusion? Oi. Gender confusion is a deception. Now we're starting to see, at least I am, uh, this frenzy about UFOs. Anti-Semitism is hockey sticking. It's based on deception. The abortion industry is based on deception. The only way we cannot be deceived is if we know the truth. And then number two, knowing the truth, what must we do with it? Speak it. And we speak it with love, with the heart of God and with the mind of Christ, lovingly, gently, meekly, yet boldly, those things are not contrary, but boldly speaking the truth to family to prodigal sons and daughters, to friends, to co-workers, to neighbors, to whoever crosses our path. Because time's running out. The fashion of this world is passing away. The time is urgent. And we, we let our light shine. How do we overcome evil? 
According to scripture, how do we overcome evil? With? With good. We return good for evil, not evil for evil. That's called Christ-like. It's not natural. It requires the Holy Spirit for us to follow Jesus. And so my encouragement is that you pray for boldness to lovingly share the good news of Jesus Christ. Don't be shy about starting a conversation. Let, let a conversation start and see where the Holy Spirit takes it. And we'll see that the more we share, the more the Holy Spirit will give us to share. If he gives us a little and we don't share it, is he going to give us any more? No. We share what he's given us and he'll give us more. Know the truth. Speak the truth. And number three, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Know who you're following. We live in momentous times. We live when before the church is a choice, compromise or courage. Be courageous. Amen? Amen. You would stand with me, please. Father, we are weak. Jesus so said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. In our flesh there is no good thing. Our flesh and the spirit residing in us are contrary one to the other. We have this turmoil going on inside of us always. And the only way our flesh can be put into subjection is by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the help you've promised to give us, the power from on high to be your witnesses, to follow you, come what may. And as the Apostle Paul was baptized with the Holy Spirit, facing a mob that wanted to kill him and had beaten him, Father, we pray in Jesus' name that you would pour out your Spirit upon us. Fill us to overflowing. If there's any online or maybe anyone in this room that has not bent their knee and confessed with their tongue that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I pray that you would pierce their heart and their mind. And may they agree with you that they're not perfect, that they fall short of your glory. And may they turn from their ways and turn to the Son. And to receive by faith the gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus. Father, the devil is really busy in these days, but you're even busier. And may you start in us and in this fellowship. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.